get going here. All right, so I just picked I picked a few problems from 7.4. This is the section you should be working on now. Um, so, and, and she skipped seven three, but she's gonna come back to it. I kind of agree with that. Um, I don't like the order of the book. Um, now that you know what a differential equation is, we, at least for an autonomous differential equation, we can draw a phase plot and identify the stability of your equilibrium points. Um, but we haven't actually solved one yet. We, well, maybe, but we haven't really solved one uh, more in the style of what you will be seeing going forward here. Um, I say that you haven't solved one be before, but you, you really did, right? When you were doing antiderivatives at the very beginning, they were the questions were posed to you as the derivative of some function is this, find the function. That was a really a differential equation. They just didn't call it that. You, and how you did it was you integrated, you found the antiderivative. Um, but these are a little bit different in the sense that um, you've got x's and y's on both sides of the equation. And the first thing I would do when you see a y prime here is to, since my y is one variable, x is the other one, let's think of y prime as dy dx. And I know I'm going to need an antiderivative. And, and the way it works with an equation, you're going to take the antiderivative of one side and then take the antiderivative of the other side. But you can't just take the antiderivative when you have two variables there, right? What we need to do is get the x's on one side and the y's on the other. And furthermore, right, if you've got, we, I think we had this discussion when we were talking about the little differential. If someone just tells me the integral of x, I, I know what you probably mean, but technically you probably mean x squared over two but technically there needs to be a dx next to it because if you had this dy, that means something totally different. <clears throat> this would not be x squared over two plus c. It would only be if you have the integral of x dx, then it becomes x squared over two because this is telling us what variable we should be integrating with respect to. And since uh, we'll encounter this in 17c, in fact, um, something like this, but right now, we need, if we have a, we want to integrate an X, we need to have a DX. If we want to integrate a Y, we better have a DY. So that's Y squared over two. Okay. This is all just doodle working. So then the idea is knowing that these two DY and DX are two really separate quantities. What I want to do is multiply both sides by DX. Because that will cancel on the left side. And now I have x squared plus one dy is equal to xy times dx, which is kind of what I'm looking for. But now what I need is I need to get only x's with this dx and only y's with this dy. So I can accomplish that if I divide both sides. Let's start first dividing by y so that it cancels here and I'm gonna have a dy over y here. And then I need to get rid of this x squared plus one. So let's div also divide both sides by x squared plus one. So that it cancels here. And when all is said and done, what I'm going to have on the left side is dy over y, or if you like, I mean, this divided by this is one. Let's, let's think of this as one over y dy. And on the right side, I still had this x divided by x squared plus one times dx. So this, this process here, that's, that's this kind of this technique. This is called separation of variables, right? Separation of variables. So like when you do in homework problems and they say, solve the differential equation by the method of separation of variables. It sounds very fancy, but that's all it is, is you're just getting your y's with your dy's, your x's with your dx. And once that happens, once you get the y's with the dy's and the x's with the dx, then what we could do is apply an integral to both sides. We can integrate 
both sides because we have the correct variables matched up with um, the differentials. One over y dy integrates to natural log of y. Um, I know we've been trained to think of this as absolute value. Um, you know what, I'm, in fact, while, while we're finishing this, I'm gonna check in the back of the book. It seems like a lot of times in these problems, they just make an assumption that y is greater than zero. So we don't have to worry about y being negative. Um, I'm gonna check, cause I took this one from the book. So I'm gonna see if the final answer has that in there. But uh, while I'm doing that, um, how would you integrate the right side? What technique of integration there? Okay, some different responses. If you're thinking u sub, what would you let u equal? Okay, yeah, so if you see, if I let u equal x squared, the derivative of that is 2x dx, which I could make work. But why not go just a little bit further? Let's just let u equal this whole thing, because that derivative is still going to be 2x. So try doing a u sub over here, where you let u equal x squared plus 1. And work that out. I'm going to check. <laughs> I should have done this ahead of time, but I forgot about that little dilemma with the absolute values. This is 7.4. Okay. Yeah, it seems. It seems to be the case. Well, now I'm going to look, actually look at the problem. Maybe they said something about why. Nope, they didn't say anything. Okay. So for these problems, and, and I would ask Dr. Burke if this shows up on a quiz or a test. Um, because technically we're supposed to have this absolute value, but when I looked in the back of the book, they don't have it there. So uh, let's just assume, and, and again, you could, you could ask this from Dr. Burke, that y is greater than zero. And as you've already started to see in class, and we'll do some examples too, this is just showing you the mechanics of solving a differential equation. The, the majority of the problems are application problems where, as you saw, like you might be talking about a tank full of salt water. And uh, if Y represented the amount of salt in the tank, that's never going to be negative. So you can kind of read into the problem and, and decide for yourself whether a variable is allowed to be positive or negative. Um, but this one has no context. So but it seems like our book just assumes that this variable is positive, which means you don't really need the absolute value on that one. Okay. All right, so let's finish off this u sub. du would be 2x dx. I have an x dx here. So in order to make my du work, all I'd have to do is wish for a two, compensate with a one half out in front, and this integral can now be written as one half. The numerator is du, the bottom is u. And that antiderivative is just like this one. It's du over u is the same thing as one over u du. This is ln. And let's, now here it's ln of u, but when I put my u back in, it is x squared plus one, which this, th because this is always positive, we don't even really need to be told anything about x. This is always positive. So I don't really need the absolute value on this one as well, but that's because I already know that's positive. And then the way it works is technically there's a plus C on both sides, right? Cause we integrated here, there should be a plus C, there should be a plus C. 
Um, but what we do is like, so let me sneak in a little plus C here and then sneak in a, so here, I'll put it right here. If we put plus C plus C, we don't claim that these constants are different or the same, I mean. So let's assume like this is C1, this is C2. The way it works is if C1 was, let's say three and C2 was seven, couldn't I just subtract the three from the seven and I'd be left with four over here, which is just another constant, right? So the way it works with these differential equations is if you get a constant here, a constant here, we could always just imagine subtracting that constant and you'd be left with another constant. So the bottom line is you, what we usually do is just put the plus C on the right side on the, uh, uh, what would that be? The, the, the independent variable, right? Y is a function of X. So whatever X is that affects Y. So X is an independent variable. So we'll just put the plus C on, on the right side. Now, you have solved the differential equation, right? We took the integral of both sides, but what we have is ln of y equals this, and it would be nice if we could just get y by itself. That's what you generally try to do is see if you can isolate the y. So how do I undo an ln of y? You're going to use e, right, the, the inverse function. So if I put an e underneath both sides, if I exponentiate, I remember doing this in 17a, uh, right? We're doing the log log graphing, the log linear graphing. This will cancel out, just leaving me with y. And we have this little sneaky trick that uh, I do remember we doing us doing this in 17a, but I'm going to remind you of it again. I call this unsimplifying. <laughs> If I have e to the something plus c, I can always think of this as e to the one half ln of x squared plus one times e to the c. Reason I call this unsimplifying is, isn't it true most of the time in your math career when you see two things multiplied with the same base, you are supposed to simplify this by writing it with one base where you add the exponents, right? Kind of like a, you know, x to the a times x to the b is x to the a plus b. Usually we are supposed to do this and write it like this, but what I had here was x to the a plus b, and I'm going to take it back to a product. I'm going, th that's why I call it unsimplifying. You're going the opposite way from what we're used to doing. And the reason we like to do that is it just makes an easier solution if, as, if we acknowledge that if C is a constant, C is a constant like four, what is E to the fourth? This is just equal to another constant. This is another constant. E to a constant is just another constant. And so what we do is we just replace this. Let's just call this C again. <laughs> so call this. What I prefer to do to, to make sure that you, you realize that, you know, it's not the same as this original C. So maybe we call it C1, just to denote that it's a different constant than what this was before. The book will just leave everything. Usually they just call it C. You don't have to do C sub one. You can just call it C, but. And that constant, since it's multiplied by this, we might as well put it in the front. And if I use a property of logs, because I'm seeing an E and an LN, I'd like to cancel that out. But first I have to move this one half up to the top. And we know E to the LN just cancels it out. So Y would be equal to C1 times X squared plus one to the one half. And I guess actually what I usually do, I, again, I like to call it C1 when I replace it, just so I know when I'm going back and checking my work, I'm like, wait, E to the C is just C? What do you mean? It really is a different constant. But when I get to my final answer, you don't, usually what the book will do is they'll just drop it, you know, they just call it C. You don't have to call it C sub one or anything. And of course, this means the square root. 
that would be my solution to this one. Let's try another one. This one's number 14. We want to separate. I, I always start by rewriting this as dy dx. And it's kind of almost an automatic first step. When we, we you, as you saw, we want to have a, like something times dy on one side, something times dx on the other. You can't have, like, you've never seen, have you ever seen this? Have you ever seen find the antiderivative of x squared over dx? Right? That doesn't mean anything, right? The, the differential needs to be in the numerator. So it's almost an automatic first step is you're going to get this dx out of the numerator, out of the denominator, I should say, by multiplying both sides by dx in this case, so that it goes away here and it's now in the numerator on the right side. That's almost an automatic first step. So we're committing to having all of our x's on the right side and all of our y's on the left side. So these, the x and the sine x are good. We want to keep those here with the dx, but I need to get rid of these two y terms. And I could do that by just multiplying both sides by the reciprocal. So this would cancel with this. So I'm going to be left with y plus 1 over y dy equals x times sine of x dx. Once I get them separated, I can integrate both sides. And I tried to pick some problems that would give us, remind us of some techniques of integration that we've discussed. Let's start with the left side. How shall I proceed on the left side? Yes, yeah, and that's exactly divide. I assume what you mean is because I need I do want to divide this because I have a fraction and when we do the the heart thing, yeah, I've seen that someone said that that actually is dividing. That's as if you divided y plus one into y. This becomes the integral of y over y, which is one plus one over y dy. So we're going to rewrite that. And then for the left side, who spots that one? I'm sorry, the right side. I said the left side and pointed to the right side. For the right side. That is a mixture problem where you've got product of two functions and no u substitution is going to help you out of that. Perfect. That is integration by parts. Yep. So we'd want to let u choose a u, choose a dv. Who should be your u? Perfect. Yeah, u is going to be x. And the reason for that is because the derivative of that is going to become simpler. The derivative of x is just 1 dx. That means your dv is sine of x dx. And your antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. So then we'll have uv minus the integral of v du. Let's just go ditto. X times negative cosine X minus the integral of negative cosine X 
times dx. And so to finish this off, you could just pull this negative out, right? And make that plus the integral of cosine of x dx, which is sine. And then, like I said on the last one, oh, what's this? We haven't found this antiderivative yet. I haven't done that yet. So what's your antiderivative on the left side? That would be the integral of one with respect to y is y. And I think we'll do the same assumption. Assuming y is positive, this is just ln of y. Let's not worry about the absolute value. And like I said on the previous one, technically there's a plus c on both sides, but we could always take this constant, subtract it from this constant, and so we'll just have a plus c on the right side. What's also... What's different about this problem from the one we just did is generally speaking, if you can get your equation solved for y, that's preferable. And I say if, because here, you know, if it was just ln of y, I could exponentiate both sides. But if exponentiating here is not going to help me because I have two things here, it wouldn't cancel out the y, it would cancel. So there's no way I'm going to be able to get this solved explicitly for y. So when that happens, we just leave it. We're just done right here. I'm just going to put um, no way to get y by itself. So just leave it. <laughs> We do, however, have an initial condition. I remember doing this when we were doing antiderivatives, right? And so we can use this to solve for C, solve for our constant. If we know Y of zero is one, put plug in, I always put IC for initial condition, Y of zero is equal to one, then, uh, and so zero means this is X, X is zero and Y would be one. So what I'm gonna have is one plus the natural log of one is equal to negative zero cosine of zero plus sine of zero plus my constant. And fortunately, a lot of things disappear here. Ln of one is zero. Zero times anything is zero. Sine of zero is zero. So it looks like in this case, my constant is just C equals one. And then I just rewrite my equation with that value of C and I'm done. All right, so there, there's two problems, two good examples, I think, of like the, the general process for separating and then solving a differential equation. But I would, especially in this section, uh, spend a lot more time and energy, you know, preparing for like future quizzes and stuff, thinking about like the, the word problems, the application problems, because that's where all of this differential equation stuff um, really is uh, useful, I guess. And there's plenty of problems that involve some application of a differential equation. And this is, this is like the top candidate. It sounds like you did one in class today. Is that right? And I know there was one on the, on the pre-recorded video. That's okay. This is good practice for you then. <laughs> So you're pretending we have, I like a little picture here, a tank 
that contains 500 liters of brine, that's just a salt solution, with 20 kilograms of dissolved salt. And so there's this, there's some little salt molecules, right? I'll, I'll put those in red. So you can imagine little salt molecules dissolved in here. And then what we're going to do is essentially flush out the system. So if you started adding pure water at a rate of four liters per minute, okay? And to be clear, pure water means there's zero salt, right? There, it's, there's no salt at all going in there. It's getting mixed up. So you're, you're adding water, but if you're draining it at the same rate at four liters per minute, There's no, there's always going to be 500 liters in the tank, right? Because I'm adding stuff at four liters per minute, but I'm draining it at the same rate. So I, the, the water level is going to stay the same. But what's going to happen in that process, assuming this is stirred up well, you know, every now, you know, little salt molecules are going to start to drain out eventually, right? Even one way over here will eventually get flushed and come out of the system. So let me ask you right now before we, because this is going to be a follow up question to this. Over a long, long, long period of time, how much salt would you expect to be in this tank over a long period of time? How many people agree with zero, right? Yeah, I mean, you're not adding anything. And even though there's salt in there, eventually, right, it's all going to get forced out. And so eventually, this is just going to be pure water. Okay, so we're, we really are flushing out the system here. And see, this is right up, I'm imagining if you're taking chemistry and stuff like that, right? This is right up your alley. I remember mixing things in chemistry and stuff as well. Although I don't remember draining them at the same rate, but I just remember adding chemicals to things and watching cool reactions and stuff like that. Um, okay. But here's what I think is really cool, just to celebrate for a moment the magic of differential equations. So You've got this tank with 20 kilograms of salt initially. This would be at the beginning. This is like your initial condition, right? This is when T is zero. Um, and we start our clock. We start flushing it out at four liters per minute, draining it. And according to this, what this question is asking, we should have a really good idea of exactly how much salt is in the tank after 125 minutes. I mean, how in the world could you do that, right? I mean, how would we know that, right? But it turns out, again, we're making a lot of assumptions. We're making assumptions that the, this thing is stirred evenly so that there's an equal chance for any little salt molecule to exit the tank, whether that's true in real life, who knows? But assuming that's true, we can actually predict how much salt would be in the tank at a certain amount of time. And the amount of salt I'm gonna call A, A of T, is the amount, I guess our units here was in kilograms of salt. That's the unknown, right? That's what's changing over time in the tank at time t. And the, this, what you have to do on these is you have to set up your own differential equation. That's what makes these problems challenging. So what we want to write an equation for is DADT, which is how, how the amount of salt in the tank is changing over time. And I watched the video, I didn't watch class today, but I saw in the video when she did an example, and, and this is a great a phrase, if you get a tank problem like this, how are you, what's your base? I'm thinking of something minus something. That's the key to setting up your differential equation. What, what did you do in class? Maybe the thing to think about is remember that a derivative is a rate of change. It's the rate of change of salt in the tank over time. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. I know that was a little bit of a generalized question, but if you always start these with the rate in, you want to think of any salt that's coming in, which is, of course, zero. But see, there's, there's twists on this problem, and maybe we'll do one next time on Friday. What if I was putting stuff in four liters per minute where there was some salt in here, 
right? Maybe there was a, a certain concentration of salt in there. Then you would have a legitimate rate in. Um, I was modeling this after the one and only book problem that is a tank problem where they don't, it's just pure water coming in. But uh, you certainly could have one with salt coming in. So even though, again, there's no salt coming in, if there was, how would we have found it? We would have said, well, stuff is moving into the tank at four liters per minute, but there is zero kilograms of salt per liter, right? This is like the concentration of salt per liter. This is the flow rate, this is the concentration. And you can think of this in you know, your whole unit, uh, when you do chemistry, right, your unit conversion, this would be the units of kilograms per minute. And of course this comes out to be zero because it's four times zero, but it gives us a little guide for how we're gonna set up the rate out. The rate out stuff is also leaving the tank at four liters per minute. But in order to be consistent with our units, we should be multiplying this by something that has units of kilograms per liter. Does that make sense? So that I have the same units, right? So that this cancels out with this and I'm doing kilograms per minute minus kilograms per minute. So the key to doing this is to think about when you're on the rate out part, the rate out is coming from the tank, not from the outside environment, it's coming from the tank. So let's start right here. This should represent liters. This should be how many liters are in the tank at every moment of time. Well, we agreed there would be 500, right? Or it said that in the problem. 500 liters was in the first sentence here. Now what should go in the numerator is how many kilograms of salt is in the tank at any time t, which is exactly our variable. That's our variable. There are a kilograms of salt in the tank at any time t. So it's a divided by 500. Those cancel out and I end up with minus 4a over 500, let's just ditch the units now. <laughs> that sounds really non-scientific, but <laughs> it's okay, because I'm a math teacher. <laughs> um, I guess I could reduce this. This is really, four goes into 500, that's negative one over 125a. All right, let's solve this. To solve this differential equation, we need to get the dA together with the A, and there are no Ts, but we need to have dT separate from the dA. So like we've done before, we'll multiply both sides by dT. And I need to get this A over with the DA. There's no reason to take the negative 125 with it. So I think my inclination is to go ahead and leave the negative one over 125 there and just divide both sides by A so that I end up with DA over A equals negative one over 125 DT. Now that they're separated, can integrate both sides. Your antiderivative here is ln. And here we don't need to infer anything because, well, we need to infer, but I mean, we don't need to be told anything about A. If A represents the number of kilograms of salt in the tank, we know A has to be positive, right? This must be positive. A is positive because it represents the amount of salt. So I don't need an absolute value. Antiderivative on the right side, the antiderivative of a constant with respect to T is just that constant times T plus our constant of integration, which we'll just put on the right side. And then we've seen this, I wanna get A by itself. So I'm gonna exponentiate both sides. 
e to the ln of a is just a. I'm going to unsimplify this. I'm going to think of this as e to the negative 125t times e to the constant so that I can just call that another constant. You can call it c1 if you want. But I will put that constant in front and As I said, if you want to be really technically correct, you can call that C1 or just follow the book and just keep it as C. As long as you're okay with E to a constant, it's just another constant, it doesn't really matter. So here is our general solution. Um, in order to figure out how much salt is in the tank at 125 minutes, obviously we're just gonna plug in 125 for T but I need to know what that constant is. So that's where it comes back to your initial condition. We were told that initially there were 20 kilograms of salt in the tank. So I'm gonna need another piece of paper here. Initial condition. And if this helps you, I mean, A is a function of T. So I just have that as A, but we could acknowledge A is a function of time, right? Because it has T in there. So you can throw in that little A of T if you want to. My initial condition was A of zero is equal to 20, which is what I would get if I plugged in zero for T. This is 20 when T is zero and E to the zero is just one. So my constant of integration is 20 and my new and improved equation for the amount of salt in the tank is 20 E to the negative 125 T. And then finally, to answer our question, at 120, when T is equal to 125 minutes, that's why I chose this because it would make the math a little bit easier. The amount of salt in the tank ends up being 20 e to the negative one over 125 times 125, which is just 20 e to the negative one. I don't know what that is. I have a guess. Who's got a calculator? That's 20 divided by e. And I know e is like 2.7, which is kind of close to three. So 20 divided by three would be like seven. I'm gonna guess it's like eight point something. Someone have a calculator. Oh, it's 7.36, okay. I was not that close. So about 7.36 kilograms of salt is left in the tank after a long period of time. And then the follow-up question to this one is you've already answered this, but we can confirm it. How much salt in the tank after a long period of time? In other words, as T goes to infinity, we reasoned that you know if you're just flushing this out with pure water, eventually it's gonna push all the salt out of the tank. But we can confirm this now because we have an equation for the amount of salt in the tank. If I take the limit as t goes to infinity, this is going to give me 20 times e to the negative infinity. If I put in infinity multiplied by negative 1 over 125, and I think we've seen this before, right? When we did improper integrals and stuff like that. If you think of this as 20 over e to the infinity, you should hopefully convince yourself that essentially, right? This is a huge number. Essentially, that is going to be zero, which is what we predicted. So yeah, the tank problem, like I said, that's a high candidate if, of 
for a, a, a future quiz or test question. Um, it's just a very common, popular type of question. So uh, maybe we'll do one on Friday where I actually give some input to the salt. I don't think we'll finish this, but we can certainly get it started just to get you a feel for like tackling something a little bit bigger than this one, something other than a tank problem. This one's number 43 from that section. Okay, and now I can see the homework. So that's gonna give me some ideas for, for next time. Okay. While you're writing that down, I was peeking at this. Okay, well, I'll take a look at that. All right, so this is a, a glucose solution is administered intravenously by into the bloodstream at a constant rate of R. As the glucose is added, it's converted to other substances and removed from the blood at a rate proportional to the glucose concentration at that time. Fortunately for this one, they give us an equation, the differential equation for it. But I wanted, what I wanted to share with you is, you know, I said, uh, let's do one that's not a tank problem, but the tank problems we generally, as a general term, we call them compartment models. And oftentimes, even if you're not talking about salt in a tank, you could view this as a compartment model. Here's what I mean. Like if you think of the bloodstream as a tank or a compartment, right? This is your blood. And we think about how the problem was described to us. Someone is injecting at a constant rate um, Glucose at a constant rate of R, right? That is just going in constantly. That's what happens when you get an IV, right? It's a constant rate of um, glucose here. But at the same time, the body is processing, meaning it's leaving the system, right? The glucose is leaving the system at a rate proportional to how much is in here. And how much would be in there is C, right? That C is the concentration of glucose in the blood. That's what our variable is. And it's leaving at a rate proportional to, that just means it's minus some constant times however much is in whatever the concentration is um, of glucose in the blood. So you can kind of see that as a tank problem, right? Stuff's coming in, stuff's coming out. Rate in minus rate out. Let's see. Just stretch our mind a little bit. How about we at least, we've got a few minutes, let's at least talk about, and I know things get weird when we don't have numbers anymore. <laughs> so let's try to separate this thing and solve, at least get the integral. So um, let me rewrite this over here. So step number one, I've seen this a bunch of times, get this DT over to the other side. And you know, remember to use good algebra here because when I, my, my first step has to be moving that DT over, which means it's really being multiplied by, by both of this, these things, R minus KC, which means, because my next step is I, try, I have to try to get this C term over here with the DC and I can't add it, right? I can't add it over because it's, it's trapped in these parentheses. That violates all your math rules here, right? Um, it's being multiplied. So the only way to get this C term over is I have to divide and I have to take everything in the parentheses with me. I've got to divide both sides by R minus KC. So that's going to leave me with DC over R minus K times C. And on the right side, it's just DT.
the variables are separated. So we'll integrate both sides. The right side is going to be easy. The integral of dt, or just if you want to think of a one there, that's just going to be t plus c. Remember, we always put our we always put our uh, constant on the right side. Now to do this, remember that r and k are constants. They're just numbers. So you want to kind of think in your head. You can kind of experiment. How would you integrate if you had like dx over I don't know. Let's say this was like five minus three x. Like say I gave r a value of five and k a value of three. How would you integrate that? What technique would you do? Exactly. Good, good. Yeah, that all came at once. Yeah, that's a good u sub opportunity here, right? So that's what you would be doing here. Um, you would let u equal, if I was doing this one, I'd let u equal the whole bottom. So I'm going to let u equal r minus kc. du is, r is a constant by itself. That goes away. It's just going to be negative k times dc. And so I have DC on the top. All I have to do is wish for a negative K, compensate with a one over negative K, and I've got this thing converted. This will be negative one over K. The numerator is now DU. The denominator is U. And that integrates to? Another ln. Yeah, we've seen a lot of those today, huh? This is negative one over k ln of u or negative one over k ln of r minus kc. And then we'll just bring this down equals t plus c. And hey, let me take this a step further. Yeah, I want to take this a step further. If you have to run, I understand. Um, at least to get to the general solution. Uh, hey, you know what I was just noticing here? We're using C to represent the concentration of glucose. And then I have a plus C over here, which was my constant of integration. Remember how we had that discussion? There's maybe a good time to not use C over here because I already have it here and I don't want to get them confused. So how about we call, instead of C, um, you know, I, the norm, normal one I would use after that is K, but I've already got K in here. Um, pick your favorite letter, or as I've suggested before, how about we do smiley face? <laughs> smiley face. This is our constant. And, and here, I, I really, I'm serious because I did, I was anticipating getting these two C's mixed up together. So there really is a valid reason in this problem for doing that, so I don't mix these up. Okay, we want to try to solve for this C right here if we can. And I see it's inside an LN, so I know I can exponentiate to get rid of the LN. But what I need to do first is take care of this negative one over K. And there's two options. You can either move this up to the exponent, we've seen that, but if I move it up to the exponent and undo the ln and I'm trying to solve for C, then I'm gonna to have to deal with that exponent. The other option, which is the one we're gonna take is if I just multiply both sides by negative K. That will cancel it out here and I'll just end up with ln of R minus KC. And if I distribute this, here's another thing to keep in mind when you're doing these. Certainly negative K times T is negative K T, but K is a constant. Smiley face is a constant. What happens when you multiply a constant times a constant? What do you get? How many people agree you get another constant, right? So the way we usually work this, it is totally fine if you decide to write this term as negative k smiley face, 
That is totally fine. But what is more conventional, what you're going to see done in the book and probably in class is we're just going to replace K times smiley face with smiley face one, <laughs> a different constant, right? So I'm just going to put note negative K times smiley face. Oh, I can, that didn't work out so well is equal to a constant. So we'll call it smiley face sub one. And, and even if it's negative, what we typically do is even a negative times a positive, you could call it minus smiley face one, but we usually just leave it everything as positive. I know it seems weird, but it, the final answer, it's not gonna, it'll, this will take care of itself. Um, okay, since I've got just a couple more steps here, we might as well keep going here. Um, this paper though. So to undo this LN, I would then exponentiate R minus KC. We'll unsimplify again. I want you to see this little trick multiple times so that you get used to it. E to the negative KT times E to smiley face one. And E, here we go. E to smiley face one becomes smiley face Two, huh? That's another constant. This is another constant. So we'll call this smiley face two. And we'll put that constant in front. Make my smiley face is bigger. E to the negative KT. And then just a couple more steps to solve for C by itself. I could subtract the R. Negative KC equals smiley face to e to the negative KT minus R. And then to get C by itself, I could divide both sides by negative K. And, and when you do that, I mean, there's two terms here. So I could divide this by negative K, this by negative K. You can even go as far as doing this. Um, this fraction right here has smiley face two divided by negative K, which is another constant. So I could absolutely replace that with smiley face three. I should be clear what I'm doing. I'm replacing this right here is just another constant. Now, because smiley face was just some random constant of integration, that's why I'm just gonna call that just another random constant. But these two were our original constants in the problem. So I, pro I wouldn't call that just another constant. I would just leave that as plus, because they're both negative, R over K. And this would suffice as a general solution for this type of a question. And then to finish it off, what you do is plug in the initial conditions that um, I think were given in the problem. Doesn't this look like fun? Where have all the numbers gone, huh? It's like alphabet soup now. All right, math. <laughs>